Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and welcome to this final session of uh, the day in the, uh, the Energy Transition Theatre. I think we've heard some really outstanding uh, speeches today around how the industry is moving towards energy transition, and I'm really excited to have this panel uh, of industry experts and thought leaders here today just to round things out for the day. So my name is Leanne Curitan. I'm the uh, Country Manager for Australia at Mining Plus. And uh, along with the panel here we have today, we've got uh, Dr. Max Ohm, who is the Innovation and Technology Manager for Murray Engineering. Nick Butler, the Global Product Manager, Power Systems and Charging Solutions at ABB. Paul Linnabry, uh, the Manager of Electrification at Parenti. Andrew Dawson, the uh, Business Line Manager of Loaded Hall with Sandvik. And Fabian Schneider, the Head of Sales for Huber Automotive Group. So, uh, Welcome to the panel. Um, and I guess firstly to kick off, um, got uh, so many topics to cover that uh, such a short period of time. Um, I guess one of the first things uh, I'll ask the panel is, it's still around, I guess, supply and demand. That's sort of certainly something we hear a lot around as we move towards electrification. Um, and forward projections and current targets uh, seem to be that demand is far outstripping our supply. Um, so how as an industry can we work towards overcoming this current imbalance? So I might throw to you, Andrew, first up. Yeah. Uh, so as the question implies, it is very much a case of, of supply and, and demand. Um, what the appetite is for new technology in the market uh, and how fast that appetite wants to be um, satiated, should we say. Um, there's no doubt we're all on the, on the edge of... Uh, an incredible and amazing change in our industry. We're moving away from fossil fuels. We're moving into to electrification, which is, it's fantastic. But the real question is, is this enough of a, a, an, an economic avalanche uh, to generate enough uh, trust within suppliers and OEMs to go and further commit to their own supply uh, supply lines or supply chain. You know, there's not a single person sitting in this room today who, when faced with having to make a significant personal investment, will not go away, do your homework, do your due diligence, and make sure everything is as it should be before you go forward and you commit to whatever it is you're doing. It's the same with, with, uh, with electrification and it's the same within the industry. Um, I just want to uh, steal a, a, just a, a couple of um, points from from Chris in the earlier in the earlier panel. Um, you absolutely nailed it on the head. Uh, talking about demand and being the first to be second, the first to be third, the first to be fourth, it does nothing for, for demand. What will happen is electrification will begin to stagnate, uh, and it really won't really won't go anywhere. Um, so there's a there's a there's a couple of things that that we can do. Um, certainly from an OEM perspective, the first one is to ensure that any early deployments, any early trials, are as successful as they can be. Now, success is defined differently for say Paul, who's a who's a contractor, uh, versus Chris, who's a who's a mine owner. So there's a lot of variables there we can all work to, and it's it's fantastic, and. Um, it pains me a little bit to say this because it's so it's really cheesy, um, but it's the notion of trust, and that notion of trust between uh, the, the customer, uh, the OEM, trust that it's the correct product, uh, trust that it's the correct application, and of course trust that um, the, uh, the the deployments will be adequately supported. So uh, it's it's a great question to strictly answer it, Leanne. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to vote no, and I'm going to say it's not as simple as ramping up production when we need it, 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 it in the face of uh, demand that's developing. Uh, how we manage this is we kind of, we go along together on, on the demand curve, and it's it's not it's not as simple as going from A to B. It's we, we kind of have to go on this, on this journey together. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, that's a good perspective from an OEM. So maybe you go, Paul, as an end user. Um, yeah, as an end user, so I think uh, as we're seeing that the demand is coming, we're Parenti Contract Mining, we're starting to see um, 
clients ask us to deliver scoping studies, deliver tenders that involve battery electric vehicles. So the, the demand out there is, is building. Um, but as you touched on, and I think as Chris touched on as well, the, the piece that's sort of not there yet is that understanding that, that backs that demand. So, so we really need to understand those vehicles and we do that through partnering, through trialing, um, through collaboration. So, so that understanding drives the demand which then allows you guys to have consistent or, or known supply. So I think that's that's what we're really pushing. Um, and then the second part around that demand, I think, and what comes through through partnering and working closely with, with OEMs and suppliers is shortening the time to market on those trials um, and, and making sure that, uh, as we said, we've got prototypes out there, how, how quickly we can take those prototypes through the whole design chain I think will sort of decrease that that bumpiness of, of demand. Thanks, Paul. And I think um, another one of the other presentations that we heard sort of said that you know electrification is not all about fleet; that it's also about infrastructure. So I guess um, you know what do we need to consider uh, from an intra infrastructure perspective, uh, Max? Um, I think that's a very big question to answer in the time we have. But I think um, interoperability and leveraging um, existing standards is the way forward. I can share that from experience of you know, other industries as well. Um, but I do understand that what we do here in mining have very harsh requirements that not any other industry uh, just appreciate or develop technology for. But there are a lot of international standards, whether it's communications down to battery systems, charging uh, protocols, and many more, I won't go into too much detail here as an engineer, but um, we should leverage what we can, focus in our efforts on innovation, design, R&D, on the parts where mining needs it most to succeed in what we want them to do for us. But you, Nick? Yeah. Hello, hello. It's working. Um, yeah, so I can only concur with what uh, Max was just saying. I mean, if we break it down into three items that I believe need to change uh, are from a minor perspective. It's the appetite to innovate. It is sort of taking a holistic and integrated approach. And last but not least as well, I mean, with the new challenges of technology, as well adapting the workforce into and equipping them with the right skill set. And uh, if we tackle the later one, it is all about, I mean, the skill set for embracing innovation, doing the change that is required, like knowing how to adopt uh, this technology, which is uh, needed to, uh, to complete that. And I can only say that uh, the collaboration around standardization is also part of a skill set that you need to sort of foster and enable within the mining uh, a mining industry. And we see great achievements actually here, and in particular out of, uh, out of Australia, coming out of the Charge On uh, Innovation Challenge, migrating into um, the Mining Interoperability Task Force, directly adopting, okay, how does the future point of charge, point of energy delivery, need to look like? I mean, how does the interfaces between infrastructure and vehicle need to look like? And this is, I mean, directly here out of Australia, really an interesting um, and an interesting piece of collaboration, which is transforming not only Australia, but as well the whole world. Um, when it comes to integrated approaches, it is, now we tackled the point of energy delivery. Now, the point of energy delivery can only function as well as the upstream services that you're looking at. Um, so it is about sitting a bit back, looking, okay, what is all impacted across the whole value chain of delivering power or energy uh, sets and services. And um, what, what do I mean with the first point of uh, um, being a first mover? And that is actually, we encourage a dual approach, which is based on studies and early trial to fail fast. We will get a lot of red noses in the upcoming years, but if we don't get those, we will not be able to look back in 10 years and say, 
oh my goodness, the solution that we planned, that we put forward 10 years ago, <laughs> it was really ridiculous. But we will not have the final step if we don't fall and pick up the ball again and run today. Okay, thank you. And um, Fabian, being the one that hasn't spoken yet, I won't just throw to you, um, just from an automotive industry perspective, what are your, your thoughts around uh, what we need to address in terms of infrastructure changes? Well, so for the automotive industry, I think they have been maybe the early adopters for the battery electrics in general and were confronted with a lot of problems at the beginning with the infrastructure side of the charging. Um, today we are in the position that we solved at least for some regions the charging infrastructure topic, not for all regions yet, obviously. Um, and we're still struggling with international standards for charging interfaces, so looking at North American standards uh, versus the rest of the world. Um, so therefore, I think, especially when it comes to interaction of systems for battery electrics like charging interface, um, there's the standardization of this is absolutely key. And my, my wish list it is that we have an international charging standard for all regions would make our life much easier. <laughs> Thanks. And I guess, um, what about reticulation and supply? What do we need to consider there? Um, obviously, we're going to, as we move towards a, uh, electrification, power supply is going to be, or demand is going to increase. So what do we need to consider there? Um, I guess, first of all, we guys, we need to differentiate uh, an open pit versus an underground mine. I mean, there's total different uh, challenges. And, uh, and in particular, looking here at uh, Australia, most of the sites are quite remote, uh, which uh, um, in both cases, underground and open pit. But overall, um, in the underground space, um, we would see in the future actually less energy over the lifetime of a mine going to a full electric mine. Uh, whereas in open pit, <laughs> to be very frank, we face significant challenges. Um, if we just take uh, um, in the open pit um, a, a truck today, uh, a 240 ton truck consumes about, it's already diesel electric, though we are a bit fortunate that we heard that before. Um, we take, talk about four megawatt and you have uh, maybe 20 of these trucks running around. So you're looking at at least uh, 50, 60 uh, megawatt, if you don't have them all simultaneously running, additional power. So there is no way around it um, of uh, stabilizing the grid, um, in, you know, like increasing the power, uh, the power supply that can either be with renewables or uh, with conventional um, um, uh, utility supply. Uh, but um, one needs to be conscious uh, when moving to renewables, you're actually um, as well having on the supply side as well as on the load side, a large amount of uh, intermittency and as well of power quality, uh, like slash nonlinear loads emitting a lot of power quality issues to your grid distribution network. Hence, um, one of the key requirements to look at uh, when uh, um, increasing um, the uh, like or adopting these kind of new technologies as Max uh, quickly introduced beforehand in his uh, in his slide um, on the on the point of charge and the energy supply is um, how to mitigate uh, power quality with a harmonic uh, filtering and um, <clears throat> a power factor compensation. That is one of the key <coughs> messages that I really want to stress because that is a bit of a hidden gimmick that uh, is often forgotten. Thanks. And I guess also, um, as we move towards electrification, there's going to be changes in costs, so both CapEx and OpEx. Um, so I guess what do we need to consider from that perspective? And also, um, I guess just a question of, as you know, as the experts on the panel, what are some of the less obvious costs that you've come across um, that, uh, or, or benefits even, um, that uh, apply here? Um. Yeah, so in the, at the moment we're, we're doing a, the IGO Cosmos study, so we're currently building out a, a cost model for that study, so got some good insights into that. Um, one thing that we're really seeing in that is, is the three big, big levers, um, cost of diesel, current price and future forecast, 
your cost of power, current price and, and future forecast if you start integrating renewables. And then the third one, which a number of people have talked about, is the cost of carbon. So if, if your mine site or company or government starts to introduce a cost of carbon, um, those three factors and, and applying those and being able to run sensitivities on those for machine models, for total cost of ownership, for mine models, um, it's something that mining engineers have done with cost of diesel and cost of power. But now those three factors are, are applying to everything. They're applying to your machines and the, the delta between them is what makes these profitable now or, or not profitable, um, which we're seeing. And I think one thing that people need to uh, sort of take, take on is that it's not just specific. So once you do it for one mine site, you've got to then do it for every other mine site. It's not uh, the same across the board. Your, your total cost of ownership and your uh, life cycle costing for an individual machine will now change at a different mine site because the cost of power and the cost of diesel and the potential cost of carbon is different. So, so that is a bit of a consideration, I think, is, is something to take to mind. And the next one that I kind of want, it's not really a hidden cost um, because it's not, they're not hiding it from us, but the battery as a service fee. I'm so going to say <laughs> the, the battery as a service fee is, is something that definitely needs to be um, front of mind for, for, these, um, for these studies. So some of the work that's coming out of what we're doing, and it's within the heavy haulage space, um, you're seeing the battery as a service fee accounting for somewhere between 20 to 40 percent of the total cost of ownership of, of a machine, which isn't a small amount. Um, so that, as a consideration, um, it is something just to speak to. I think that uh, just goes a little bit further on, and I don't want to digress too much, but um, battery as a service is a, an absolutely fantastic uh, example, and it's it's not that we we don't know what our our cost bases, because we do, um, but it, it like you said, with the different applications and the different mines, and we're just a little unsure what to apply where at what particular time. So battery as a service sounds like the most easiest thing in, in, in like on paper, it's so simple. Uh, but in, in a practical application, it's actually very, very tough tough to manage. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot we can do with that without railroading or going off in a different direction, this really highlights the importance of, of collaboration. So OEMs, we build equipment uh, and we sell equipment and we support equipment, we don't use it. So we're, we're a little, this is why collaboration is so important, but deep, in, deep collaboration. And I'm not talking about, here's my battery machine, go and use it. I'm talking about really working together and, and understanding the, the ins and outs. Um, the last one, and that's probably not quite well understood, is the life of a battery. So we know that a battery can degrade over time. If you if you fast charge your battery all the time, a battery all the time, your life expectancy on that is going to, is going to drop rapidly. If you have a little more, um, you know, favourable charging philosophy towards that, it's going to last a lot longer. How do you apply that to a battery as a service? So how do you know when your battery is going to last? You have absolutely no idea. So that's I won't say it's a hidden cost. It's kind of a hidden cost. Um, it's probably more of a not hidden but not understood. If I can add to that, I think um, very often uh, we consider the um, battery and mobile equipment assets uh, cost separately from the infrastructure costs, also because it's a different organisation that's supporting the bill. You know, so I think often we forget that the, the, the investment in the infrastructure way outlives you know, the mobile the equipment, the vehicles. So I think commercial from a commercial perspective, there needs to be a tighter uh, relationship, integration, or more open dialogue <coughs> between mobile assets and infrastructure as well. We want this magic to happen. Yeah, I mean, just to add as well, I mean, this opens up a whole new area of uh, business potential. I mean, the whole circular stream or circular economy could be run with a battery running the first life on the vehicle, Installing it as a secondary life in the station, uh, in the, as a, a stationary storage application. So there is actually means to make the most out of the asset once you first have invested into it. It is all going back to: Do we have the right mindset? Do we have the right partners together? And 
E, are we enabling them to come up with these kind of models? Are we enabling them to, uh, yeah, to provide us miners? So like in that case, I would take the perspective of a miner to make this happen. Yeah? Um, and if I want to add to what Paul just said, and, and um, um, sorry, uh, Andrew, um, the point is understanding all of these little uh, bolts and tweaks that we can do is only possible if we're doing the studies. Okay, is it a fast charging uh, application? Is it a battery swapping application? How does this imply, how does this change for uh, or like the mine layout, the mine design? How does, how does my point of charge, my point of energy delivery need to evolve over the life of mine? All these are questions <coughs> which are tying back to the skill sets which we have not had before putting together. A mine designer was not talking to an electrical engineer. We need to learn to leverage the advantages of the technology that we're putting in and not focusing on all the disadvantages. And there's a, there's a real potential to make it actually successful for some of the mines today. I mean, I this might sound very stupid, but uh, there are examples in the world where they shifted the whole mine plan to a downhill operation because the batteries are, will be recharged going downhill. It's, part in a, it's a project in Canada. Yeah. So this thinking tank or this thinking process, this somehow needs to be enabled. And uh, this will be actually the path to, su to a successful implementation. Yeah, so I think I fully agree with um, all the comments on that. Um, I think the complexity is increasing for that, and also the requirements to the due diligence is uh, significantly um, uh, higher nowadays. Um, and from perspective of as supplying electric vehicles to the market, it's something where we have always the feeling that we got reduced only on the CAPEX side. but. Um, it needs to be also considered that the OPEX is something which needs to be implemented in the sourcing strategy. Uh, so at the moment, we don't, we, are, we don't feel that. So typically, we are confronted with a limited budget on you need to replace that kind of amount of vehicles. And so decisions fast made for, for diesel vehicles instead. Um, but it needs to be clear, and Max presented in a very good way, that the total cost of ownership of electric vehicles I just can't speak for the light vehicles. Um, it's already lower than for the for the diesel ones, and it's getting to, to be lower also for the future. And finally, it's also strategic key from from our perspective um, that the mine operators get prepared for this transformation step very fast because others get in this position to already start the transformation. They get a commercial benefit out of those, and if you don't be prepared for this step. As, as a mine operator, then you're losing finally your cost benefits on the market. Thanks. And, and I think some of the things that you, uh, you, you all touched on, um, particularly around the evolution of our thinking and, uh, and the skill sets, what do we need to shift, I guess, in the way of our thought processes around process safety? And what does that look like in, a, in an electrified mine? How will we need to adjust? Um, well... Process safety, safety sort of operational safety. Um, I think the the mining industry, well, I don't want to say does it perfectly, but does safety quite well. There's there's the risk based approach, um, consequence sort of model, um, which is what we're taking and, and pushing forward with with battery electric vehicles. Um, so so I'm not necessarily sure that the the approach itself has to change too much, but what will change is the review and the sort of, we do need to go back and revisit nearly every single procedure for in an underground operating environment. We need to go and revisit every single procedure that currently exists on our mind. So we might not change everything about them, but there could be bits and pieces about how we operate now that in IGO's all electric mine will definitely be operating differently. So those, those sort of things and, and it's not just when you move to full operations that that needs to happen. So, for instance, the trial that we're running 
to, to run a trial on an operational mine site, you need to have ticked every single box from safety uh, to ERT to sort of myriad of different things to, to make sure that, that that is going to be a safe and successful trial. So the trials aren't easy in operational environments. If anything, they're probably harder um, because that's, that's what you have to do. You have to get, get them up to an operational standard. I could certainly agree with that. Um, with the experience that we've got from the underground mine trials and having you know, designed and built an electric vehicle, I can say that there's so many challenges and roadblocks in getting something onto site, like you say, your safety risk assessment, the engineering inspections, everything's very difficult unless you can design and produce a vehicle to be as similar as possible to what the users are familiar with uh, in terms of the operation as well as the maintenance. So sharing our spirit, for example, the way we isolate a high voltage vehicle is not very different from a standard diesel vehicle and that helped a lot in getting it across those lines. And secondly, the way it looks, feels and moves, we make it such that um, someone can jump in without you know, any you know, much training before that. We normally just give her a you know, 15 minute you know, familiarization to jump in and off they go to drive in the return and we get feedback without any you know, catastrophe as accident to take touch wood. So I think in doing that, it does help the transition and the learning process because there's always cost involved with time, people learning, changing mindsets. So the simpler we can make it, the less groups jump through, I think that will help the industry overall. Yeah, further to that point of, of isolation, so we, we had um, a, a machine turn up to site, a diesel equivalent machine already operating um, with one isolation point on the machine, new battery electric machine turns up, looks exactly the same as the old one, but now has four isolation points on it. Um, and to be honest, from an operational perspective, that's that's probably that for us that wasn't acceptable. So so we had to go back and, and work with the OEMs and say, how can we reduce the amount of isolation points? How can we make sure that um, that this is as similar? So we got it down to two isolation points on the machine. Um, which when you think of it, the, the, it was a drill. So the drill has a battery, which needs to be isolated directly at the battery, but it also plugs in the 1,000 volt when it's doing its task. It has, I think it had a step-down transformer in it as well so because it had onboard charging. So there was multiple different isolation points and different energy sources, um, which wouldn't exist in the normal diesel drill, but it looks exactly the same. And, and the maintainers have to operate that and, and continue to sort of do their work safely. So getting that across and, and making that, uh, those changes was pretty critical. Yeah, there is exactly what we mentioned before, where collaboration and uh, standardization actually jumps in. And we have, uh, I mean, a massive task. Uh, we, we have sort of a standardized interface in the, for the low power applications. But if we are moving upwards uh, for uh, the open pit applications, we're looking at three, four, five, ten megawatts we are speaking. I mean, today we're talking in the mining task force about a 10 megawatt supply. Uh, that has other um, standard implications. And actually, frankly speaking, there are no standards existing today who encompass that and who could manage this. And I believe, I mean, for us as an, as an OEM, and we want to try, obviously, to stay agnostic, to provide solutions for every uh, a mine uh, truck OEM, and as well to simplify the life for uh, the miner. And this, on the other hand, you can simplify for us the life by coming together, defining these common standards together with us, such that as well operational procedures, safety aspects are tackled at the same time and are not changing from mine to mine, which will have then a different implication on a technical solution, which obviously increases cost, increases time to market. And uh, this is I mean, a sense of urgency, which uh, I think we need to solve uh, this going forward. So I guess, um, yeah, thanks for that, Nick. I think, uh, you know, we could talk about this for a very long period of time. It's such a broad topic and, uh, you, you know, we don't have much time left. So I think, you know, one thing just, you know, from each of you, where where to next? I think that was the the ending of the uh, the topic. So where do you see, see us going and what are the next steps that we have to take, whether it be in a, in a one, five or ten year time frame? So we might start with you, Max. 
Um, I mentioned this a few times in my presentation just before this, and I think um, where we can make the most difference now is in the infrastructure, uh, power supply side of things. And I mentioned that you know, energy storage, battery energy storage systems will, in the short and medium term, uh, help to accelerate that transition to overcome the uh, bottleneck in uh, you know, sufficient uh, power supply. It's not that we don't have enough power, it's just that we want all of the power at the same time during a shift change. And I think that's where the, uh, where the real problem lies. So we don't want to necessarily you know, invest so much in infrastructure just for one change in the technology itself. So uh, maybe there are um, gaps we can look at in how we operate procedures and workflows that can help to accept technology as it is without too much you know, impact on what we do in mining, but the overall you know, net result is still you know, positive. Thanks. Paul? Um, yeah, so I'm going to put my mining engineer hat on um, and say that, to be honest, probably for the last 30 years, mining engineers have probably been pretty lazy. So we, we've been able to kind of skate by on, on 30 to 50 years of operational knowledge um, that hasn't really changed and, and how to sort of mine these decline diesel shaft mines. Most mining engineers could look at a ore body and, and chuck a decline in it or tell you exactly how it's going to be mined. Um, but that, that's not the case anymore with battery electric vehicles. There's, there's too many variables still at the moment that we don't yet understand and we don't have the, the background knowledge. Um, shafts, conveyor, we've, we've talked a lot about fleet, but, but just different met methods of haulage railveyors, conveyors, battery electric vehicles, fuel cell hybrids, trolley assist, um, straight diesel, straight BEV. There's eight different methods of haulage that we haven't yet fully understood in the mining industry. So I think it comes back to what we were saying before, which is planning and studies. And just whatever you thought that your study, if you wanted to do an electric mine study, whatever, however many hours you thought, was going to need to go into that, I'll probably double it because the scoping side of things and the, the trade-off between each individual thing now it is not understood. It's not understood in the industry and the industry is going to take time to, to understand those different trade-off studies because the technology is still evolving. Um, so that would be my final. Uh, if I could sum it up in, in two words, I would say flexibility and, and freedom. Um, so I guess what I'm going to say is at great risk of not having any original thought at all. Uh, I'll be taking points from Darren and, and, and Paul and, uh, and Nick there on the end. OEMs need the the, um, uh, the the flexibility and the freedom to fail in, in, the, in the development of, of products. Earlier on we were talking about trust and, and the trust that the product is it's fit for purpose and it, it's fit for the application and it will be supported. Yes, but we, we have to get there. And OEMs need that, that flexibility to, to put something out in the market. You know what, if it fails, if the, elect, if the electric system fails or the battery fails, it's okay. You know, we're going to kick on and we'll, we'll push on. We're not going to, you know, haul you into the office for a, for a please explain or please reimburse me. Um, the, the ex, what we do find, you know, we're very early on in, in the piece. Um, and right, wrong, and different, I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, but expectations are that BEV is going to outperform diesel. Um, it's going to be more cost effective. And of course, it's got to be, it's got to be similarly priced. So we're kind of finding our way uh, along there. And uh, I guess we just need the freedom to, to continue what we're doing, continue with the open collaboration with, it, with our customers. Um, and I just one last thing, Paul, you brought up. Uh, just to add to adding to the pressure of, of undertaking trials, aside from the significant cost of, of doing so, um, it's 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 the the added pressure of putting a machine into a, into a production environment. It's people's backs up really quickly um, if if something goes uh, all, all right. Um, the other one is the there is there is expense tied to to um, to trials and. To do them properly, you have to invest in training. You have to invest in your own people, parts, service, whatever. Um, so there's a there's a lot going on, kind of in that space. Um, and for us, it's collaboration is the is the answer there. Thanks, and we've got Fabian. 
Yeah, so I'm pretty much a little bit more or less conservative, I would say. <laughs> so I don't agree with Paul 100% because um, for some part of um, the equipment the mining industry needs, I think the suppliers or the OEMs are already ready. Um, meaning effectively, we are ready to s supply what the mining of the industry needs and wants. So uh, we have been spending about seven years right now in this segment to get experience and do trials in the market all over the world. Um, so for us, it's important to get commitments. Um, so finally, commitments which will result in a real transformation process, what has been communicated to the market with regards to the scope one and scope two reduction um, of emissions to 2030. Um, and from there, I think this is the next step for us to go in the partnership with different customers, uh, with the mining industry in general, and uh, create commitments, which brings us also in the situation to create a sustainable business case out for battery electric products in the market. Okay, I will keep it short. <laughs> I mean, uh, just uh, a call to action. Time is now. All electric mine will not happen overnight. It will take time. And uh, I can only urge study and trial and try to adapt it to your mining processes. Learn from it, what we have today, and then we will mature together um, to the goal of having an all electric mine in the future. Thank you, guys. Fantastic. Um, yeah, look, I think that we are out of time, and as I said, it is a, such a broad topic that we could have spent quite a lot of time talking about that. Um, I really do feel privileged being able to share the stage with such a, uh, a wealth of knowledge and the experts, but uh, yeah, if you could please join me in thanking the panel, and uh, please catch up with uh, everyone throughout the conference if you have any further, further queries or questions for them, but thank you very much.